uh, this morning, I was talking about it, just had this on my mind, about what motivates or what drives people to want to have power, to want to control things. There are, we, we have a phrase that we use to describe people who, in every situation, they, it seems like they have to be in charge of everything. What, what phrase is that that we call them? You, can you think of one? Control freak. Ring a bell. Um, when Matthew was in Little League football, um, the team wanted a place to have a, uh, like an end of the season party. And they asked me if they could use the, our church fellowship hall. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. And so uh, one night this team came and there was food and cakes and all kinds of stuff. And they were playing games and everything like that. And I don't remember exactly what this one woman, what all she said. But, you know, I tried to host to all these families, you know, I want, I want to be seen as a good guy, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, we can reach somebody for Jesus and, you know, maybe influence them a little bit. So I'm trying to be nice, but there's a woman there that is, I mean, I believe she is a control. She didn't like the way the food was set on the, on the table down there. And she didn't want to be she didn't like where the chips were. And she kept trying to guard me, telling me what to do, how to put this there, and how to do this, and how to... I don't remember what all she said. But I'm going, God, I'm thankful that I'm not married to that. Thank you. And I just had my fill of her. I don't know what it is that gets in some people, but they think that they have to be dominant in every group, in every situation, and in every place... Yeah, I said it this morning. I believe what compels them is fear. Fear. Now you would think people with power don't have fear, but they do. The thing that they fear the most are people that they cannot control. They cannot control them. How many, how many dictators in this world's history have tried to dominate the entire world. How many? You had Alexander the Great? What's, what's up? When you go like this, it really goes in and out and I can't hear anything up there. You know what? Maybe the batteries. Give me, give me a minute. Check one, two, three, check one, two, three. I'll leave it up. I'll leave it here. So anyway, I, I believe it's fear. Um, what was I saying before John slithered in here? Conquering the world. Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, all the Caesars of Rome, they wanted to expand their territory and conquer and dominate the world, rule the world. Then... They find out there's a whole hemisphere. You know, Europe finds out there's a whole world over here on the other side of the world that they didn't know about. And so what it's all about is them conquering that. The Vatican does that. They want to go in and conquer and take over everything. Look at the billboards in the St. Louis area. These mega churches who have this massive compound with thousands of people in it, but they're not satisfied with that. So they rent space or they build it or whatever in some other county, like Jefferson County, and they put a satellite church there and draw people into that. 
And what they're doing is they're pulling people out of what probably was good, decent, Bible-believing churches, and they're drawing them to an entertainment center, telling them what they want to hear, telling them it's okay for them to keep their liquor and to shack up with each other and everything. They won't say that, but they will not deal with the issue of sin in people's lives. And they doom their souls to hell. But they want to, they want to spread out and dominate and be the big dog of all the churches. Okay? So, like I said this morning, ecclesiastical power is probably the worst kind of power. People will defy a dictator. But they will die for their God. Won't they? World War II... The Japanese generals convinced these young pilots. They called them the kamikaze. You know what that word means? Divine wind. They labeled them kamikaze. They were to take their planes rather than trying to bomb the ships at sea. They were to steer their planes directly into the ships at sea killing themselves, but they believed that they were doing it for their sun god emperor, who they believed was a living, divine, human god on this earth. It's what they believed. And when we defeated them in World War II, the first thing that MacArthur demanded from the emperor was, you can still be emperor, but you're not a god. And I want you to put that out. And that's what happened. He announced that he was no longer a deity to those people. They will die for their God. And it's hard to control that. Um, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Some of you who have... Uh, God bless you guys back there, Robin and, and um, Batman. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming today. And... Um, she said, I, she said, I've been listening to you so much, I finished all your sentences. So she probably knows what I might say here. 2 Thessalonians 2. In this case, the Antichrist is not just a man, another man. People followed Hitler out of fear. But Hitler feared people that he couldn't control. Jews, communists, socialists, and British and Americans. He despised them. So, in his mind, kill them. And we'll have a pure breed all across the world. It would be a Germanic breed all across the world. That's what he had in his mind. Was to dominate the entire earth. But Britain said, no. We're not going to capitulate. We're not going to give in. You bomb us all you want to. But you're not getting our king. Okay? And America joined in and said, you're not, you're not taking us. So when a man rules over man, there's always people that he can't boss, that he can't dominate. There's always resistance. And, he, and those rulers always fear them. But in this case here, this Antichrist is not just another man. I believe he will be a God-man. A God-man. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Here is the man of sin. The Bible calls him a son. S-O-N. He is literally a child. Perdition is another word for what? Hell. It's another word for hell. So he is literally is a child of hell. A child of the devil. And he says in verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, including this, the word was God, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So he opposes himself and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. And I taught some of this in, up in Iowa or uh, Indiana last weekend. And boy, eyes opened up because I, I had read all the verses in 1 Corinthians where it said, Know ye not that your body is the temple of God. Ye are the temple of God. Ye are the temple of the living God. 2 Corinthians says that. What, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. So our bodies is that temple. And the Antichrist, here's what I absolutely 100% believe. That the Antichrist is not just a mere mortal with political power. He will be a God residing in the heart of mankind. And in that case there, he will have control and power over every human being except the church of the living God. Thank you. Now, we dealt with Esther. So we know who Haman is. How many of y'all were blessed by that? Say amen. It was God's idea. I'm telling you. It was God's idea. Now, Let's look at how much power our enemies actually have. Okay? In Job. Turn there. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 2. Can I get some water from somebody? No, don't spit on me. Job chapter 1. Look at verse... Let's go to um, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? And what he's saying is, is he doing this for nothing? And I want to remind you of the Bible's description of love. Love, pure love, is giving in an unconditional way blessings and benefits to people that are your neighbors, your family, whoever it is. And your God. I serve my God because I love Him. When I was a child and I came to an altar at Bible camp and asked Jesus into my heart, I was afraid of going to hell. I still don't want to go to hell. Don't want to go to hell. But now, thank you, Mr. J. That's all right. There. I don't want to disturb the pretty stuff here. Um, what was I saying? Ah, I don't want to go to hell. I serve God now because I love Him. I love Him. He doesn't have to do anything else for me. He's done so much that if I lived in eternity, which I will, and serve Him, I would never pay the debt off. But it's not a debt. Because He offered it to me unconditionally. For God so loved the world, the whole world, everybody in the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is something that my mind, you know, I've got sons. I don't know that I could be Abraham. I don't know. But I'm serving God because I love him. And Job serves God because Job loves God. Some people have it backwards. They think that they must serve God to keep salvation. They think that they must perform now and do and do and do. Uh, we had a, there was a man who spoke last weekend up in Indiana. He was a New York Jew. Uh, but th he describes himself as a Messianic Jew. He believes in Jesus. And um, 
Where was I going with that? Well, my mind is racing 100 miles an hour. Yeah, that's what he said. He said that uh, when you ask a Jew how they're going to get to heaven, they'll say prayer, repentance, and doing good works. That's how you get to heaven. That is the old covenant method. And it doesn't work. Because God has these sins laid up against them. And those sins must be laid on the cross of Jesus Christ that they don't believe in. So they can never be saved unless they accept the cross of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So Satan is asking that question. Doth Job, you know, serve you for nothing? Verse 10, hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all, let, watch this now, all that he hath is in thy, there's that word, power. And what did the devil do with it? He took everything that Job had away from him. Gone. His wealth, which was cattle, gone. His children, gone. His servants, gone. Satan took everything. He has that power. God allowed him to do that. When I was talking to uh, the, the man that, the family that we're going to have sing, and I'm going to put up, they, they've got a website where you can print their posters out and things like that. And uh, I'll try to promote that in the community if we can. Um, I even thought about having it outdoors. But I don't know how we would do that. But anyway, when I was talking to him uh, yesterday, and we were talking about how he's, he's gotten pretty picky about what churches he goes to now to sing. Because he's, got, he's raising his family, and he's been in churches where he knew they were preaching false doctrine, and his kids are hearing that. And he said that at one point, God allowed him about six weeks of using a business agent to get, you know, places to go and sing, and it would make it easy. And he said, God allowed me to do that. And after six weeks, I realized that it was a huge mistake. Now, sometimes God will allow the devil certain powers over you to teach you the difference between what's good and what's not good. How would I know that an agent is probably not a good idea, except this man went through it and he said, mm -mm. we were singing in places that there's no way in the world that I would let my kids listen to that. Bless his heart. I said, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, in chapter 3, oh no, chapter 2, Verse 1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord the same way he did and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still, still. He holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. It's easy to serve God when it's a picnic. It's easy to have faith when we don't need it. But that faith always will be tried and tested and taken through the fire. What does the fire do? It changes. If you put metal through a fire, cool it down quickly, you've altered the molecules in that iron. You've tempered it. That's what tempered steel is and tempered glass. It's tough. 
Very hard, very sturdy. That's what God does with us. He's put us in the refiner's fire to get out the dross, the things that are not pure in us, to remove them from us. So the things that you have gone through, are going through now, or will go through in your life, is God's way of drawing out things that are not good for you to put you on an easy path toward heaven. I believe that. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in other people's lives. And so, verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. That is a symbol of power. If I have, uh, I have all these girls working for me, my daughters, my daughter-in-law, sometimes my grandchildren, Rose, and John, and Michael, and all them, I have them working for me, they are in my hand. If I, you know, I told you I'm not a boss, I'm not bossy, but if I said, hey, I need this done, it gets done. Michael's dealing with something going on in Kenya, so I asked John, or Michael asked John, and I asked John, John, can you go upstairs and run the camera? Yep, he's up there. It's in my hand. Satan had Job's body in his hand. But God said, you can't kill him. There's a limit. God said, you can't kill him. That's how much power the devil has in certain situations. And I want to say this. There's some people who see sickness and disease as maybe some result of some sin, which is possible. I believe that. Or some attack of the devil, which it could be. But the fact that God allowed it to happen convinces me that God had a purpose for me in going through that. All things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. When I look back on my life, I see the refiner's fire many times in my life. God purifying me, God sanctifying me, working me. Molding me. I'm the clay. He's the potter. And sometimes he will allow wickedness to thrive. Look at the next verse, Psalm 37, 35. I have seen the wicked in great power. Like now. Now. Um... YouTube wanted me to watch a video last night. It, it my little deal on my phone of a man going into his elementary school. And he's apparently, I think he's got his phone in his pocket with the camera on. He's recording this because the teacher made his grandson put on a dress two days in a row to teach him transgenderism. Wicked! And that man, and you could tell he was a black man by his voice and by his, his the way he was saying things. And he said, we don't do that in our house. Now, he didn't bring God into the picture or anything like that. I don't, I don't know that he's saved, but he knows that wasn't right. The wicked took power and was trying to dominate over that child's life. Hitler did it. The Hitler Youth Squads. When it came down to the last battle of World War II in Germany, Hitler had children shooting at Russians, dying in the streets, because he convinced these blonde-haired, blue-eyed boys that they were a superior race to everybody else. And it's funny that Hitler was not blonde haired, blue eyed. <laughs> he was a mongrel. But I've seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Uh, I was going to put a picture of this on there. Have you ever seen like a, it's like a Roman crown where they have a bay leaf or a bay branch on both sides with the bay leaves coming out. 
Have you ever seen that? I was going to put a picture on it. You pull up your phone and type in bay leaf crown or something like that, and you'll probably see examples of it. That, to me, tells me that that represents evil and wickedness that is spreading and taking power throughout the world. It was given to the Caesars of Rome. They wore it on their head, if I remember right. Their goal was to try to dominate. And some of those Caesars were totally wicked. Nero was. Caligula was. Caesar Augustus was not a good Caesar. And murderers, killers, evil men. We're living in a world right now where wickedness is everywhere. It's in houses. It's in schools. I, going back to this video, this teacher was like, well, you'll have to take that up with the principal. And he said, no, you're the one that did it. I'm talking to you. I don't put a dress on my grandson and you're not going to put a dress on my grandson ever again. And I'm going, Woo! go get him. When you see the wicked coming after you and the people you love, you'll fight back. You'll stand against it and say, I'm not having that. I'd rather die than live in that kind of wicked environment. Micah chapter 2, verse 1. Micah is a little bit hard to find. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Micah chapter 2, verse 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. In other words, they lay in bed and just think about how they can control everybody. How they can take what's not theirs. Uh, can I show you something? God showed me this one day. And I just about fell out of my chair. I sent this to Reg Kelly. And he said, that's exactly right. Turn to Psalm. Psalm. Um, no, Proverbs 1. Turn to Proverbs 1. I want to show you. Socialism and communism. Socialism and communism is a way for the government to own everything and everybody. Everybody. In communism, the government owns the factories. They own the farms. They own the cities. They own everything. When we were on a... a a cruise with Sterling and Gloria. We went to one island where it was in the Caribbean or Caribbean where everybody on that island received a government check every month. Well, I say about 80% of the people were paid directly by the government. The government's main source of income was, guess what? Cruises, tourists. It used to be sugarcane, but now it's tourists. The government then owns all the shops, all the tourist locations, everything. The money that goes in goes to the government. The government then doles out a check to 80% of the people on that island. And you could tell the difference. If you go to Mexico and go to their shops, their markets, they will chase you down the street to make a sale. Anybody ever experienced that? Oh my goodness. And my dad loved that. Me? I don't like it. I don't like it. So I pay the price. Okay, that's fine. I'll pay it. And if I don't want it, I'll, I won't buy it. But it, in that country, I can't remember what island it was, but in that country... We, we stopped, we were on a tour of the island, and we stopped at a little kiosk area, and there were little, you know, trinkets for sale, and they had bathrooms and everything like that. We got out, and the people working those little shops were just sitting there on their phone, or reading newspaper. They weren't hustling us. 
They weren't trying to make sales. They weren't doing anything except taking the money and sitting there. It didn't matter to them if I didn't buy anything. Why? They're still going to get paid. That's communism. That's socialism. Look at Proverbs. Verse, chapter 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. Verse 13. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Spoil is what they've stolen when they conquered everything. Um, and then they say, verse 14, Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. You know what that is, Sterling? It's communism. The bank is centralized, the power is centralized, everything is in the hand of the government. They tell everybody what they can and cannot do. They pay everybody the exact same wage, except for the elite, the top 10%. They are the wealthy ones because they're either in the government or connected with the government. And they are multimillionaires. That's what that communism and socialism is. It is stealing power away from people. The power, your power over your property, your power over the things you own, in communism, you don't own anything. It belongs to everybody. It's, and that's what that is. And I sent that to Reg Kelly and he said, that is exactly right. That's communism. So Micah chapter 2 verse 1 again. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And there are just some people born on this earth genetically designed to conquer, take over, and control. Organized crime. Gangs. There's always somebody at the top who has all the power. You don't kill anybody unless you get permission. You don't steal anything unless you get permission. You don't do anything unless you get permission. You are owned by that mafia boss. And that's what that's what the liberals in this country are turning this country into. A mandatory, do what we say, state. And I'm against it. Amen. John chapter 19. Look at this. Oh, I love Jesus. Jesus is my hero. I told you this morning, I'm not, I'm not a control freak. I don't think I have to be in charge. When I was younger, I was a little bit more zealous about it. I thought that I could impose my way on everybody, and I learned you can't do that. Unless you have a lot of money. <clears throat> John chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Because he had asked him, You know, who are you? Why don't you talk to me? If you look in verse 8, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, He was more afraid. When he get, well, let me back up here. He, he saith unto Jesus in verse 9, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate didn't realize who he was standing in front of. He was in the presence of God. God. He said, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest not thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. I... Um, I told this before, I attended a funeral of a 13-year-old girl that died in her sleep. And I can't remember the circumstances, but it was, she was related to, some, I think it was somebody in Sister 
I don't remember whose family it was. But anyway, they wanted me to... Who? Miss Waymar. Okay. Yes, yeah, because Jim Waymar preached. They had me sing, so I was back in, a, in the piano room with my... It was, she was my former piano teacher. And I sang a song, and they had three preachers, because she went to three different churches in her life. The first one was a Lutheran preacher, and he gave some liberal nonsense... The second preacher, she had gone to a charismatic church. And this charismatic preacher said this, and I just about jumped out of that room. He said, because the girl died in her sleep, no cause whatsoever. Just died. Nobody knows why. But he said, Satan won a great victory here. I'm going, no he didn't. No he didn't. Yes, God does give Satan power over death. Does he not? That's what the scriptures say. But remember Job. He had the power to take Job's life, but God forbid it. And Satan, who is in total rebellion against God, obeyed God. Rep, think, swallow that, chew that up and swallow it for a while. Let that settle down in your soul and you get the realization that God is always in control of every situation. Amen. Thou couldst have no power at all against me except that were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. I believe he's talking about Israel at that time. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. This is our enemy. This is where, where his power base is. Paul in Ephesians, in, in chapter 1 especially, um, he's describing salvation. He says, You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance. And then he said in chapter 2, verse 1, and you, and he's speaking to the church, all the people, hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we were like Lazarus. We were, our life was full of sin, and we stank, and we were corrupt, and everything that we did was evil. We didn't realize it. Because there are people out there who say, I'm not going to anybody's church. I'm not going to sit and have some man tell me what to do. But the thing is, they think that they're free from being told what to do, but they're following the spirit of Satan himself. Because it says in verse 2, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, the, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, in the children of disobedience. So, the corruption that we see in our government, our financial systems, our big businesses, in religion. I, listen, the Vatican is all about power, control. What they wanted to do with our radio station in Samburu was... Buy us out and take over and offered a ridiculous amount of money. And I said, we're not for sale. Boy, we fought some battles. We have fought some battles. Because the prince of the power of the air, he works through people and causes them to rebel against God to go against his church. And it, listen, I've had families after family after family come to me and say, we raised our children right, we homeschooled them, we did this, we did that. I mean, we taught them the Bible, we were King James, we, did, we followed your ministry, we followed other ministries. Boy, we laid it on the line for them. And all of a sudden, somebody come in their life and, and friended them and boom! Gone. That's the spirit that has power over everybody in this world. But Satan fears 
us. He's afraid. What does a cobra do when a cobra detects something that might attack him? What does he do, Jaden? Huh? Not, not at first. What does a cobra do? God said, therefore hell hath enlarged herself. Deer will do that. Bears will do that. Cats will do that. They, their hair sticks out. They arch their back. Dogs will show their teeth. They will try to enlarge themselves to make themselves look big. Spiders will do it. Oh, it's funny to watch spiders do it. They're like... <laughs> it's because they're afraid of us. They're afraid. Because of who lives in us. They rec Listen, de every devil knows who's saved. I believe that. They know when the spirit of the living God enters into their principality area. The area that they have power over. And when they come in, when you come into a situation or with people and there's devils in that place, I, I believe you'll know it. I believe you'll know it. So everything that you see going sour in this world is the result of sin, unrepented sin, unconfessed sin, people living in sin, loving their sin, loving their flesh, and serving Satan. I know it sounds weird. They're devil worshipers. They don't go to a church with a pentagram, but they are devil worshipers nonetheless because they do what the Satan tells them to do. Mm -mm -mm. Now look at Luke chapter 4. Ooh, I got to move on. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. God, or excuse me, this is Satan. Got the, Boy, I messed that up. This is the devil telling Jesus, I have all this power. And he does. He is the prince of the power of the air. He's over every. He's, he owns all the kings. He controls death. I mean, he's got a pretty good business going. Shooting people down to hell. And he wants the one man that he cannot control, he cannot conquer. And he entices him and he says, I will give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus is like, no, I'm going to come take them. You're not going to give them to me. I'm going to take them. They're mine. I created them. All this power will I give thee and the glory of them. That tells you that Satan has an immense Amount of power. Big time power. Ooh, I want to say it again. No! I want to preach the gospel. When you see corruption in politics, in businesses, all these chemical companies, making all this poison everywhere, dumping it in places. It ends up in people's well waters. You got these chemical companies being sued all over the world because they are corrupt and they kill people. And when you see that kind of stuff going on in churches, religious things and so on, educational systems, that is the prince of the power of the air. Working. That teacher, and that, that kid, those kids probably weren't even kindergarten. Kindergarten. And that teacher is like, I did, I did what I wanted to. She, I mean, she had an attitude about this thing. She wanted power. She's controlled by power. 2 Thessalonians 2 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So, watch this now. Here's God, the Father. Here's Jesus Christ. God gives to Christ all the power of the earth, gives him everything. Puts it in his hand. Says, you're the king now. The devil does the same thing, only opposite. In Revelation 13, 2, The beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. 
He handed it over to the Antichrist and said, conquer the world. Revelation 13, 4, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And uh, if, you've, if you've heard me say this, we are creating computers now that surpass the ability of mankind and they're growing in that capability. There are very complex and complicated games in this world. I don't understand a lot of them. Go is one of them. It's a Japanese game and it's like messed up the way you play it. The best Go player in the world was beaten by an artificial intelligence machine. Go is like checkers and chess. They are war games. Then they brought in this guy who's a gamer. He's a professional guy. I used to say, you, you will never get a job playing video games. Boy, was I wrong. He's a professional gamer. And there's this one kind of game. I don't know what it is. But it's a, it's a two-dimensional shooter game. You got all these enemies coming in. And you got to hit the keys all these keys and do all this stuff and hit all these people and kill everybody so you don't get killed. He's the best in the world at it. And they brought him in to play their artificial intelligence computer and their computer beat him. The best player in the world. So look at that verse again. Um, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? God allows the Antichrist, the beast, to be so powerful, he cannot be conquered. And if you look at the Bible, verse 5 in Revelation 13, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Verse 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to what? Overcome them. Boy, we don't like to hear that. But I will tell you, in life, getting your tail kicked by the devil every now and then is good for you. And he exercises, verse 12, all the power of the first beast before him and calls of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And notice, he did not force them to worship. He causes them. That's the difference. Now I mentioned Elon Musk this morning. I'm going to close. Elon Musk, multi richest man in the world. When you've got $55 billion in your wallet, to buy the largest social media company in the world. You got money. $55 million, billion dollars. He bought Twitter. But Elon Musk, and I think he's right, sees the power that artificial intelligence is gaining. Who's ever went to look something up on your computer and your, it's like your computer already knew what you were going to look for or your phone? I'm going, it read my mind. That's weird. And it's getting more powerful. And Elon Musk said, yes, we are creating a, 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 we're creating a devil, a god, a monster, a beast. That term has been used to describe artificial intelligence. And he said, it will come to the day when mankind will not survive against artificial intelligence. So, his remedy is join with artificial intelligence. Link in. He's got a company making a neural net that lays over your brain that connects you to AI. Don't do it. Don't do it. Amen? Father in heaven, I don't like getting beat up. I don't like seeing my family get beat up. I don't like seeing my church people get beat up. It bothers me, brings me down. I don't like it. Father, put it in our hands, put it in our minds and our heart, put it in our feet to stand against all the wiles and the power of the devil. All the power that he has and control that he has in this world. 
Father, you, you gave Satan power over death, but through Jesus Christ, you've given us victory over death. Father, we love you. We, there is no other option for us. There's no other religion because all the religions are going toward Satan. Father, we trust you and we trust your word. Bless this word tonight. Open our eyes to what's going on in this world. Help us to see, Father, the power, the corruption, the control, the evil. And we give you all things in Jesus Christ's name and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.